Hi everybody. So in this part of the chapter we are going to be going back to look at something we started discussing in our previous chapter which is the idea of an accumulation function. Now we said in our previous chapter that an accumulation function is any function that is defined as the integral of a different function. So all of the equations that we start with in this part of the unit are going to look like this. g of x is going to be the integral of somebody else. We're going to be describing these functions using some vocabulary from earlier this year. So we thought this was a good start was to maybe just review that vocabulary. So let's start with reviewing. A critical point is a place where, so let's start with this g of x, the original function, has a critical point when the derivative g prime is equal to zero or does not exist. So a critical point of the original, we can figure that out by looking at where the derivative is zero or does not exist. Now along with critical points, because this is kind of all part of talking about the first derivative, we're going to talk about increasing and decreasing. So the original function g of x is increasing when g prime of x, the derivative, is greater than or equal to zero. Increasing is just another word for has a positive slope. So the original function has a positive slope when the derivative is greater than or equal to zero. Now g of x, the original function, would be decreasing when the derivative has a negative slope so is less than or equal to zero. So the original has a negative slope when the derivative is negative. Now on another side we kind of looked at the second derivative and how that could help us describe our functions. So we said a point of inflection of the original, so g of x has a point of inflection when the second derivative is equal to zero or does not exist and changes signs. So it doesn't count as a point of inflection unless the second derivative actually changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. Then we said the second derivative making it equal to zero, finding these critical points, can actually help us talk about concavity. So the original function is concave up when the second derivative is greater than zero. Now concave up, we said, is up like a cup. It's curved like a cup. And we said the original function is concave down when the second derivative is less than zero. And we said that that means it looks like it's curved down like a frown. Now the other kind of vocabulary that we could use to describe functions was the idea of maximum, minimum, absolute maximum, and absolute minimum. To find a maximum or a minimum, what we usually do is we look for a maximum. So g of x has a maximum. when, and a maximum is just a high point, it's just a point on the graph at the top. 
of a mountain has a maximum one. We said there were a couple options for figuring this out. Option one is that g prime, the first derivative, changes from positive to negative. So in other words, if you were to picture that in your head, the graph would go uphill and then downhill, which is why the first derivative is changing from positive to negative. Or, we said the second way to figure this out was that g prime of x is equal to 0, and the second derivative is less than 0. So if the second derivative is less than 0, we know that we're concave down like a frown, and if the first derivative is equal to 0, we know we must be at the top of that hill. To find a minimum, so the original function g of x has a minimum, when, and we had a couple options again, either number 1, g prime changes from negative to positive, so if we were to picture that graph, the derivative would be going from negative, meaning downhill, to positive, meaning uphill. Or we said it's possible we could check this by saying is the derivative equal to zero and the second derivative greater than zero because if the second derivative is greater than zero we're concave up and then the derivative equal to zero means that we have to have a horizontal tangent line so we're right there at the bottom. Now the last thing we checked for absolute maximum and absolute minimum. Now absolute maximum and absolute minimum is a little bit more specific than just any old max and any old min. From absolute maximum and absolute minimum the g of x, the original function, has an absolute max or not has, I would say could have, I'm sorry about that, at places where the x values where the first derivative is equal to zero or endpoints. So we said because endpoints can also be high points and low points, we would have to make an options chart. So we would make a chart where we had the x and the y values, and we would just make a list and see which one was the biggest. Now the original function g of x could have an absolute ma minimum at x values where g prime of x is equal to zero or the endpoints. So once again we said we would need to make an options chart. So we would make a chart of x and y values, and instead of just looking at for the highest y value, we would look for the lowest y value. Now that's the first thing we need to review, is just some vocabulary we're going to be using. But now we also need to review something called the fundamental theorem. So one of the things we learned in our previous chapter was sort of a rule for taking the derivative of an integral. And what we said is that if we want to find the derivative, of this function, then the derivative of this function would be the same thing as taking the derivative of this integral. Now what we learned was that to do that you just take the bounds and you drop them in. So the derivative would just be sine of x squared. Now the only time it got a little bit more complicated is if you take the derivative you would still drop in the bounds 
But then we need to worry about the chain rule of the bound. So times, and we would multiply by 6x plus 7. That's the derivative of the, what you dropped in, the chain. Once we combine these two ideas, we're going to be able to work with what are called accumulation functions. So let's take a look. An accumulation function is any function that is defined as the integral of a different function. So g of x could be defined as the integral from some number to x of a totally different function. Now we've done a little bit of work with these before. So let's look at an example of some problems we've actually already tried. Let f be a function defined on the closed interval from 0 to 7. So it's just telling me my graph goes from 0 to 7, consisting of four line segments, which is shown here. Now g is the integral of f. So this is the graph of f, and g is the integral of this function. Now you'll notice that if you read the questions here, all of the questions ask us about g. None of the questions ask us about f. So we're going to have to use f to talk about g. To find g of 3, what this means is that this is the x value that you're plugging in. So g of 3, if, and I would, you have to show your work here in order to understand what you're doing, g of 3 would be the integral from 2 to, in this case, x now is 3, of f of t dt. Now if we think back to the basic understanding of what an integral means, an integral means we're going to be finding the area. So if I look at my graph, g of 3 would be the integral from 2 to 3, so this area right here which is shaped like a trapezoid. So to calculate this area, I would just do 1 half times the height, which is 1, times base 1, which is 4, plus base 2, which is 2, which means my answer would be 3. One, another type of problem we've already kind of worked with is find g prime of 3. Now before we can find g prime of 3, we're going to need to find g prime of x. Do not plug in your number till you have an equation that has an x in it in which to plug your number. And showing this step was often worth one point on the AP test, and the answer is often worth another point on the AP test. So showing this is required. You can't just do this in your head. You have to actually do it on paper. So the derivative of g would mean taking the derivative of this integral, which means I would just drop in my x. So I would have f of x. Now we need to make our x value 3. So I would say g prime of 3 would be f of 3. Now, in this problem, once we had plugged in our number, we said, oh, an integral just means find an area. But here, when we plug in our number, this just says find f of 3, which is just the y value at 3. So if I go to my graph, the y value at 3 is positive 2. So my answer here would be 2. Finally, the last part, and we've done this before, says find the second derivative. Now the second derivative here would be, and again I'm going to do this with x, not just jumping straight to plugging in numbers, would be the derivative of what I had in part b. So the second derivative of g would be the derivative of f, which is f prime. Now I'm going to plug in my value. Oops. So I would say g double prime of 3, which is f prime of 3. And now we need to think about what that means. Now the first one, to find an integral, we find an area. 
The second one, to find f of 3, we just look at the y value. The third one, to find f prime, we look at the slope. So at 3, the slope of this portion of the graph would be down 4, right 2, which means my slope would be down 4, right 2, which is negative 2. Now we're going to kind of move into some problems that take it one step further. So these are all problems we've done before. Now we're going to move into some problems that use the new vocabulary. So find the critical points. Now critical points of g of x are places where g prime of x equals 0 or does not exist. So in order to figure that out, which is kind of the first step because it says then, identify increasing and decreasing. So we need to do g prime first. g prime of x is equal to 0. So let's think about what g prime of x was. When we took the derivative of g earlier, we said g prime is just f of x. So if I want to know where f of x equals 0, I'm looking for where the y values equal 0 or don't exist. In this case, there are no places that don't exist, so the y values are going to equal 0 at the x-intercepts. So 0, 4, and 6. Then it says identify where g of x is increasing and where it is decreasing. g of x is going to be increasing when g prime is greater than or equal to 0 and decreasing when g prime of x is less than or equal to 0. Now one thing you can do to help yourself out here is to remember that f of x is really g prime. So over here on the graph, right next to where it says this is the graph of x, I would write this is also g prime. They're the same thing. In other words, since this is the graph of f, since this is g prime, figuring out where g prime is greater than 0 would be everything that is above the x-axis. And g prime being less than 0 would be everything that is below. You may remember we used similar thinking when we were looking at the graph of f prime earlier in first semester. So in other words, when we were looking at the graph of the derivative. And if you look at what we just wrote here, this is the graph of the derivative of g. In this case, we're just calling it f. But it's really g prime, the graph of the derivative. So g, prime is g of x is going to be increasing whenever the graph is above the x-axis. In this case, it would be on the interval from where 0 to 4, and then also from 6 to 7. Now we're going to be decreasing whenever the derivative is negative. So since this is the derivative, that would be where we are below, which would be from 4 to 6. All right, let's take a look at a couple more questions we can ask you. Now, it's the same given information. It's the same graph. I just put it on the second page as well because I wanted to make sure that you didn't have to flip back and forth. So find the x-coordinates of the points of inflection of g of x, then figure out where g of x is concave up and concave down. Now, once again, I want to remind you, this is the graph of f. But in this problem, f is really the same thing as g prime. So we're just looking at the derivative of g. So we are going to have points of inflection when g, when the second derivative, which we already know from previously in what we wrote down that the second derivative of g is just f prime, when the second derivative, which is f prime of x, is equal to 0, or does not exist and changes signs. So where would that happen? Well, our second derivative would be the slope of this graph. In other words, we're looking for where the, this graph changes from going uphill, positive slope, to downhill, negative slope, or vice versa. So that's going to happen here at 2 or here at 5. So we would say at x equals 2 and 5, 
we're going to have points of inflection because that is where the slope of this graph changes signs from positive to negative or negative to positive. Now g of x is going to be concave up whenever the second derivative, so the slope of this graph, is positive. Now this graph has a positive slope when we're here from 0 to 2 and when we're here from 5 to 7. And g of x is going to be concave down whenever the slope of this graph is negative. So from 2 to 4 and then from 4 to 5. Now you might be wondering why am I breaking this up into two intervals? Why can't I just write from 2 to 5? And the reason is because since there's a corner here at 4, that is a place where the slope of this graph would be undefined. So I can't write one big interval because that would be including the 4. And 4 is a place where the slope doesn't exist. Finally, let's think about the x-coordinates of the maximum and minimum, absolute maximum, and absolute minimum and justify our answers. So to figure out an absolute minimum or absolute maximum of g of x, we are going to look for places where the derivative is equal to 0 or does not exist. Now in this problem, the derivative of g, and we've done this before in the problem, is the derivative of this integral, which is just f of x. So, in other words, where are the y values 0? Now, we actually called these the critical points earlier, 0, 4, and 6. Now we're going to make an options chart. So we always start with this, and then we always do an options chart. And the reason we're doing an options chart is because not only could the maximum be at 0, 4, or 6, it could also be at the endpoints. Now, 0 is one of the endpoints, which is already on our list, but 7 is another endpoint, and it wasn't on our list. So we would have our x values, which are 0, 4, 6, and 7. And we would have to now find our g of x values, our y values. To find g of 0, we're just plugging 0 in to this function to replace the x. So in other words, it would be the integral from 2 to 0 of f of t. Now on the graph, the integral from 2 to 0 would be this area right here, which is a triangle. And since we're going backwards, because we're going from 2 left to 0, our area is going to be negative, and I'm going to do 1 half times the base, which is 2, times the height, which is 4, so negative 4. To find g of 4, that would be the integral from 2 to 4 now. which if I go on my graph, the integral from 2 to 4 would be the same size triangle but going the other direction. So now I'm going to have the same size area but just positive. The integral from 2 to 6, so g of 6 would be the integral from 2 to 6. The integral from 2 to 6 would be the same integral that I just did would be the same integral that I just did minus this little triangle that's underneath. So it would be 4, which is the same integral I just did, minus the little triangle that's underneath, 1 half times the base, which is 2, times the height, which is 1, which would just be 4 minus 1, which is 3. And g of 7 would be the integral from 2 to 7, which again would be the same thing I just did, the 3, plus this little triangle that we're adding back in here at the end. So 1 half 
times 1 times 1, which is 3.5. Now from this list, the absolute maximum is going to be the biggest number on the list, and the absolute minimum is going to be the smallest number on the list. So if I look at this list carefully, the biggest number on this list is positive 4. And the smallest, most negativest number on this list is negative 4. So as my final answer, here's what I would say. Um, absolute maximum of 4 at x equals 4. And I would have an absolute minimum value of negative 4 at x equals 0. Now you'll notice that in the directions it says justify your answers. The nice thing about using an options chart is that that counts as justifying your answer. So you don't have to say anything in words to explain your work. This is also a big portion of points on an FRQ because this is a lot of work. I'm not going to lie. This is a lot of work here, but it's usually worth four out of the nine points for an FRQ. Last but not least, let's pull back something from earlier in this chapter. Find the average rate of change of g on this interval. Now we said that average rate of change was just regular old slope. So we would do g of 3 minus g of 0 over 3 minus 0. Now lucky for us, we actually found g of 3 way back in part A. I know it seems like a long time ago. g of 3 was 3. We found g of 0 in part F. g of 0 is negative 4 over 3. If we hadn't found those y values for g earlier by doing the area on the graph, we would have to find those now. So 3 minus minus 4 is 7 over 3. All right, I know this is a long video, and I know this is really complex. We are going to be spending a bunch of time practicing this in class, and it really comes down to knowing the vocab. So when I see you, we are going to do a bunch of practice, and good luck.